Hey guys, this is Noel Lopez from e-commerce disruptors, and I'm extremely happy to welcome our guest uh, today. Sam, if you'd care to Yeah, my name is Sam Mullikarjanan. I'm the former head of growth at HubSpot Labs, taught advanced digital marketing at Harvard University, and was until recently the chief revenue officer at Flock.com. So Sam, first of all, extremely excited, excited to have you on the show. Uh, see, you're, you're quite in a picturesque uh, area right now. <laughs> this is my uh, vacation photos from Mongolia. I spent three weeks riding horses in Mongolia last year. Oh, no way. That's incredible. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And what brought you out to, to Mongolia? Uh, I really liked horses. Uh, and for my HubSpot sabbatical, every five years, you get like a big period of time off. Uh, I wanted to do something that was the opposite of tech. And so I just started Googling like weird stuff to do on your sabbatical, uh, came across an expedition like this. And uh, yeah, it was great. Just three weeks riding. We went up to the mountains and saw the Eagle Hunting Festival, which is hunting with eagles, not hunting eagles. I always wow. feel the need to clarify that. Right. Um, uh, yeah, it was a great experience. Great country. So I'm definitely going to have to keep that in my back pocket once, you know, once this is all over to, as, a, as a potential trip there. That sounds amazing. Yeah, absolutely. So Sam, uh, I gotta say, just you know, you have an incredible, incredibly long history with e-commerce, um, even with teaching, like you said, at Harvard, that that innovation management course, and and a, a big portion of that is is really how to profit from chaos and uncertainty, and it's given everything that's happened, happening right now, and and with businesses, how would you say, how would you say e-commerce business should really pivot in, in this instance and, and what should be, they be doing during this pandemic? Yeah, it's noteworthy that, you know, when we talk about Darwinism and survival of the fittest, it's not actually fittest, it's survival of the most adaptable. Uh, just like when, you know, an asteroid wiped out the dinosaurs, these big powerful creatures, it was the smaller creatures who were faster and more adaptable to change that, that actually survived. Um, what characterizes small business and mid-market companies, especially in e-commerce, where you have like low fixed costs and highly flexible sort of like supply chains and logistics um, is being incredibly adaptable, right? So you can, you can change the things that you're selling, you can change your positioning, you can reduce your inventory or lower your prices. You can do all these things dynamically and in real time that larger companies can't do. Larger right. companies are like stealing an, you know, if a mid-sized business is a speedboat, uh, you know, Amazon is an aircraft carrier battle group, right? It just doesn't turn very, very quickly. Right. Um, also, like the larger companies built a lot of their positioning advantages off of things like next day delivery and logistic services like that. And all those advantages are gone. So, you know, a lot of the things that had made um, the large incumbents just unable to, like we weren't able to compete with them uh, are at least gone for the moment. Uh, and people feel more connected to small businesses, right? Like they want to, it was already a trend, but they want to have, they want to support companies where the stories behind the impact of their money make them feel good. Uh, you probably can't name any employees at Amazon unless you have like friends or family who work at Amazon. Right. Uh, but there are companies I buy from online where like I know the names of the CEO and the head of marketing, and even though I've never met them or anything else like that. So telling those stories too and creating a more, this is not the time to pretend to be bigger than you are. This is the time to pretend to be, to be as human as you actually are. Absolutely. I, we actually had a, a, a guest uh, from CrossNet. If you haven't actually checked it out, it's amazing. It's, it's four square and volleyball combined together. Really cool. And it, it, was, it was very similar. We were talking, you know, with Chris, uh, one of the founders and, and basically that, that humanization and that, and that component is so vital that you, kind of lose with with these much larger companies you knew the name you know the brand but you know i wouldn't be able to tell you someone from amazon unless i knew them personally like you mentioned um and one and one thing that you mentioned that is interesting is really you're losing a lot of these benefits that they were able to provide uh previously and i i know in your book actually inbound uh commerce how to sell better than amazon uh, to me that seems more relevant now than ever especially with with so many e-commerce businesses that are emerging and I guess my question for you would be, what are tips for these emerging e-commerce businesses? Yeah, so what Amazon's big weakness is, is the fact that they try to be everything to everybody. There's a great book on them called The Everything Store. Um, and it's noteworthy that the title of my book is not How to Sell More Than Amazon, uh, because we'd be doing this podcast from 
my like remote mountain lair uh, or something <laughs> like that if I can sell more than Amazon. Uh, but better than Amazon you can do. Um, the two key characteristics are the purchase phase of the buying cycle is extremely competitive. Uh, and that's where Amazon shines is helping people who know what they want to buy. Like you just go to Amazon and your research process and decision making process is generally done somewhere else. Uh, so if you can reach customers in the research and comparison phases of the buyer's journey this is where things like content marketing, social media, user generated content come in handy. Uh, you can be the one to help them make a decision. And if you're the one who helps them make a decision, you're the natural trusted advisor for them to buy from as well. So it's less competitive to fill the top of the funnel if you move further back into the buyer's journey. It's, it's also way more effective right now. So if you look at content trends, uh, people are spending more time on mobile devices as you'd expect right now. Their, their minds are like very loosey goosey in terms of where they're researching, the rabbit holes they're going down. Uh, so it's a, it's a golden age of uh, content marketing versus purchase phase marketing um, right now. Um, and then the flip side of that, the polar opposite end, not enough e-commerce companies spend time thinking about the lifetime value of a customer. So like, you know, I always use Starbucks as an example, even though it's an old case study now, but their average order value is like five bucks or six bucks and their average customer lifetime value was like $15,000. Um, so you're not spending $2 to sell a $6 cup of coffee and sandwich. You're spending like $2,000 or $5,000 to acquire and retain a $15,000 customer. Um, and so instead of somebody buys from you and then you sp spam them three times a week with a coupon for some variation of the thing you just sold them, um, right. like I just bought a TV from you and now I'm getting like four other like, hey, here's 50% off another TV. Like I don't have that many rooms in my house. Um, being able to get good at the upsell, cross-sell, resell, uh, going wide in what you can offer them. Not, you don't need all 500,000 versions of a television. You need to understand that person's lifestyle and be able to sell them more. Um, and then if the, if your customer lifetime value goes up, your ability to be competitive in customer acquisition goes up because the amount of money you can spend to acquire a customer goes up. Um, so all of those are fundamentals universally. Uh, they haven't changed since we published the book back in 2012, 2013, uh, whenever we published it. Uh, but they're even more relevant now as the large incumbents have lost their, um, they have big fixed costs. They're hard to, they're hard to pivot, right? So those companies are hurting whereas smaller companies tend to be more agile. Uh, they've lost their core advantages and consumers' behaviors have shifted even more in favor of smaller businesses who are able to do effective content marketing and teaching. Absolutely, and I, I think that's, it's vital because consumers are, have so much more information available. They're able to compare these prices almost instantaneously. You're, you're able to really look at all these products and, and if you're able to add more value within that research phase, that's really where you're going to capture them. And I think the, the lifetime value is, is something that of a, uh, of a consumer is often overlooked, unfortunately. It's, it's like you said, you know, you're not, you're not spending that money to, to acquire just one purchase. You, you want to create that, you know, that raving fan who's going to continue coming back, but also get their friends in on it, provide those referrals, that, that, that content that is just so authentic that, that really beats, you know, that those, those, traditional marketing efforts that a lot of big brands will do. So Yeah, ironically, one of my favorite business quotes of all time is from Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon. Um, when, he, when they first added reviews to the website, he got a letter from his investors saying, you know, hey, Jeff, we know you think the internet will be big and all, but you obviously don't know how to run a business. Why would you do anything that would discourage people from purchasing? And that's where he came back with his famous quote, we don't make money when we sell things, we make money when we help people make a purchase decision. Um, they're just bad at that still, even though that's their aspirational goal from their CEO, because <laughs> again, they're trying to be everything to everyone. Um, and, and the small businesses have focus and they have, they also have, you know, a core of fans, right? Like it, it's been a, the last century was my sales and marketing team can beat up your sales and marketing team. The next century is my community of empowered customer fans can beat up your sales and marketing team. Uh, so that's another advantage that the smaller businesses uh, should absolutely lean into. I have no incentive to leave a review on, on Amazon. I, I don't care. Um, but I am more than happy to proactively leave reviews uh, for companies who have, first of all, taught me something and helped me make a decision. Uh, but then second of all, that I have a more human connection to. Absolutely. It, again, boils back to that, that 
that human component. And speaking of Jeff Bezos, he, he does have a, you know, this, this whole segment where he's talking about the, the customer experience and, and trying to, to really improve upon that and, and, and make it better. And I, I think that's something that these smaller businesses, can, again, feel that connection to more so now than ever with, with everything that's happening. People do want to support their community. They want to support these small businesses, these the faces that they can actually put to, to them versus, you, you know, these giants that, again, are faceless. Yeah, I, I won't go too much into the, like the strategic lecture bit of this, but there's a framework that just everybody should familiarize themselves with called jobs to be done. Um, and Henry Ford is the most famous quote on this where he said, if I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Um, there's something that you can do for your customers that Amazon can never do. And that's the warm fuzzies, right? It's why like I never like panhandlers on the street or something like that. I never object to it because they have a service that they're providing in exchange for compensation, which is the warm feeling you get when you like help, help people out. Um, the, that is, we call, we call it a, a moat or an extendable core when we're talking about strategy planning. It's something that a competitor literally cannot do unless they adopt your business model. Amazon cannot make people feel good about spending money with them. Uh, that's something only you can do. And so if you lean into that, that, you can offset, you can create an unfair advantage for yourself and offset the advantages that they have. Right. And do you see that these smaller businesses are actually kind of incorporating this angle with their marketing? There's, there's so much marketing now and uh, out there. How would you say that they should pivot that into the way they're, they're reaching out to their consumers or even speaking about their products? So a weird I, I, it's, I don't necessarily want to call it positive, but a weird positive side effect of this is everybody working from home has lost to their minds, uh, including marketing teams and executive leadership teams. Uh, and what I've loved is how human the marketing has become. Like it's, it, it, everybody just stopped being so uptight about uh, their email copy and, you know, their social media posts and their videos being perfect, you know, like, I, I am not dressed appropriately for a video interview, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and my microphone isn't right and I'm next to a dog park because where my people have just accepted that like life, um, that like we're allowed to be human, we're allowed to live these lives. And I, I have seen that. Like I, there's a, a pizza restaurant in Charlestown, Mass called Jenny's uh, that I, I just absolutely love. They, they've just started publishing all of these great stories. Uh, they have people who don't even live in Charlestown uh, calling them and buying other people pizzas, right? Uh, you know, especially like the first responders, medical staff and stuff like that. Uh, and it, it's such a noticeable change for these businesses, especially small businesses. They, they have what I call the pufferfish reaction, right. which is they want to seem bigger than they are. Um, and we've all just become so deflated over the last two months that none of us are puffing up anymore. And we're all, we're all finally doing what we should have been doing all along which is um, having more meaningful engagements, uh, having, it's, it's not just like a faceless brand that's talking to people. It's the people in social media, whether they've been told to, or they've just decided they don't care anymore. Uh, the people running social media teams and accounts and stuff like that are, are just so evidently more laid back and, and empathetic. Um, so I have seen people start to do it from that perspective and the pivots have been interesting, right? So. Uh, the face masks and stuff that I bought came from the people who made our laundry hamper. Uh, and it's, it's been an interesting forcing function for all of these companies. Again, as I say, go wide across a customer's uh, life lifestyle, be able to sell them more things that are relevant instead of just having a hundred thousand options of the same thing. Uh, the situation has forced those companies to say, how else can we provide value in our customers' lives? Uh, and I, I, I hope that that mentality and that point of view carries through after this. And I, I think that's an interesting point where it's, you're, you're really seeing the, the genuine person behind, there's always this idea of, of you know, you've got your, 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 your work persona and, and your home life persona in, in, in a certain sense. And now those are really coming together in, in a way that, that we haven't seen to this degree before. And it's, it's incredible the way that's, that's beginning to shine through these brands. And it, yeah. it it makes them, you know, it's, it's like, okay, this, again, that level of humanization is, is, is incredible. It's, it's huge there. So the most amazing thing to me is LinkedIn has now become a, an, a useful social network. 
It's not just a directory of random connections. Um, again, people have lost their minds. I, I have one friend who's posting, uh, uh, or one connection who's posting just daily gratitude and stuff on LinkedIn and these insights into their lives. Um, and that's stuff we would normally wouldn't do on LinkedIn. We do that on Facebook, on Instagram, on Pinterest, something else like that. Um, but it's become, uh, it's become just like safe and accepted slash people just don't care anymore, uh, to actually be who you are and be yourself. In addition to being a professional, a knowledgeable professional who, who is trustworthy and adds value, uh, it's, you know, we now also can, you know, you know, share more context about how we live our lives at work and, and, the, and the way that that line is blurred. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's bringing in more in that, that personal component. And I, I think people have also just become even more understanding too. It's, it's, Hey, we're all in this together. Hey, you know, I've, I've been on calls and I've, there were conferences and, and seen different conferences where you're, you'll hear someone's, you know, someone's child yelling in the background and, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's no longer, a, a, I'm, I'm sorry, everyone understands, like, listen, I, I totally get it. Not a problem at all. So it's, 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 something interesting and, and, and something good that has come out of all of this is, is people connecting even, even more so regardless empathy. of the that we have right now. That's a good point. I hadn't really thought about that, but yeah, empathy uh, is going to hopefully will go up after this, um, which is now people have so much more empathy and sympathy for, you know, the, the challenges that everybody has to face, right? Working from home is not a vacation. Uh, you know, the person you're talking to and trying to hard close on a sales call or the person who's not answering your nurturing emails or whatever, like they have kids just like you do, uh, you know, who are, uh, <laughs> they were going to answer the email and then the kid puts something in their nose, right? Like, uh, you're right. Like, I think that um, just that one benefit of people being more empathetic, being forced to be more empathetic uh, is going to be a positive thing for the world in general but it should also be positive in terms of how we design and monetize uh, businesses um, as we ha have a greater understanding of, you know, our customers' lives and our partners' lives and our coworkers' lives. Absolutely. I, I think it's, it's something that is, is prevalent now. And like you said, I'm hoping that this continues to carry, carry through even after, you know, we begin to return to, to, to normal. Um, <laughs> if we'll call it that. So I would say, you know, what, just uh, kind of a, a last question, what would be recommendations that you have for e-commerce businesses that are kind of just emerging in the market right now? Is there anything they should be doing or, or what would be kind of your, your top tip there? Design for flexibility, design for adaptability. Um, a, again, without turning this into a lecture, the, the death of vertical integration meaning that uh, the ideal business owned the entire supply chain, um, what is something that we need to take out of our minds. Uh, you know, I have, a, I, I have a certification in Lean Six Sigma, which is an operations management, uh, you know, sort of uh, methodology. Uh, at the end of the Lean Six Sigma era and the beginning of the Agile era uh, is what you want to think about. Don't build your business for efficiency when you can build it for adaptability and innovation. Uh, it's the great paradox of businesses. Good businesses must be innovative. Good businesses must be efficient. And if it, innovation is inefficient, uh, bias in favor of innovation and bias in favor of flexibility and adaptability. The world changes super fast right now. And you don't want to have to turn an aircraft carrier battle group just to survive. Yeah. And it's, it's, I, I think a hundred percent, it, it just does boil down to that. Like you've been saying, the adaptability. It's huge. If you're able to pivot and shift um, and quickly do that quickly, it, it's really going to ensure that you can you can build and 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 really grow from from what's going on and what's happening. So, Sam, I wanted to say thank you so much uh, for coming on to the show. It's been incredible having you um, and and just speaking to e-commerce and, and the way that businesses should be adapting and and what you can be doing. Um, and, and how that's impacted just, just our lives in general. It's, it's, it's interesting to see how, how this has been pushing people uh, in a different direction. So Sam, I want to say thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, I'll keep Mongolia in mind. Absolutely. It sounds like an incredible trip. And thanks to everyone out there for tuning in. Appreciate it, guys. And we'll see you on our next episode. Thanks for having me.